Obviously, once you read the script, you start to break down the script, think about the characters, the research that you have to do, and then, you know, you begin to crew. You, depending on the job, if it's a period job or it's a job where you're sourcing and it's not made to order, then you look for the crew that's um, specifically for that job, whether it be tailors, researchers, assistant designers, supervisors, or buyers, if it's a sourcing job. Oh, wow. I was, um, a fitter on a um, film called Starsky and Hutch and it was a period show, 70s, loosely based and I was um, allowed to dress about 3,000 people for six months and I just fell in love with it after that. People, I take a walk, I walk outside and people inspire me. I mean life, it, if you just look around you, that's your inspiration. It can be buildings. It can be anything like that, nature. Essentially, your actor is the canvas, and so if they, really what you're giving them, the costume is the tool for them, one of the tools to help them do their job and find their character, and if they're not comfortable, then it's, it's a no-go for me. There are moments that sometimes you struggle finding it, something that you may have thought would work well, and it just hasn't worked well, perhaps because of the energy that you're feeling from the actor and if they're just not if you're if, if there's not a strong communication then you know that's where you start and then you start to build on that you know and it can take a couple of fittings before you really nail it Danish girl is um, a movie about two characters that um, already existed one of them is Lily Elbert she was uh, the first transgender person we know when I had the first uh, talks with Tom Hooper, the director, he said to me that he wanted me to think that Lily was a woman that was trapped in a man's body, uh, almost like a jail. And that was the, more or less the sort of like the point of departure for the whole design. At the beginning when she was uh, in Ina's body, to be like a sort of like a really rigid sort of uh, uh, costumes, like, you know, very, very tailored with high colors, really hard, and softening her up through the whole movie. I always think that costumes have a really, really amazing power to communicate and also to get emotions from other people. Sometimes people get so offended by the way you dress. And we have to think that at this time, a suit was always like, you know, assumed they were men. And this particular suit, we wanted to create this ambiguous feeling with it. If Lily was dressed as a woman, probably a lot of people wouldn't even question but I find sometimes ambiguities like much more shocking than the self-assurance that people would have if they saw Lily dressed as a woman. So the, the fantasy dress I, I, I love to speak about, it was a, a dress that in its entirety probably cost over 10,000 Canadian dollars um, for a movie that had a tight budget. This was a very uh, big piece of the budget and so I started in half scale, and I've done that before in Mama, and I've done it before in Carrie, where we start with a half scale refining the design lines, and then um, we did about five different muslins in half scale, and Guillermo and I looked at it, and we uh, refined the design both from front, back, side, um, and when we were finally ready for it, we, we built the actual full scale again in a muslin, um, and then had that as a rehearsal dress so that Sally was able to rehearse in it and I was able to watch the choreography uh, making sure that the design of the dress was going to uh, be enhanced by the choreography and also not have anything that was going to trip her up because that was a huge um, a huge uh, concern for me I, I could I had sleepless nights thinking that she might trip on that dress uh, in any case once once the the design was finalized we uh, went to full scale with the, with the fabrics and you know some of the fabrics were $450 a meter and literally totally cut up and then re replaced onto the dress and at the end of the day there were four layers within that dress um, and then we had a ton of Swarovski crystals put on on top and at some point there were you know five set of hands we were all working on it till literally hours before it played and we probably would still be working on it now if we, uh, if we had the time. So it was a, a special piece, um, especially since it was such a, you know, polar opposite from the rest of the movie. Everything else was very worn in and working class, and this was totally like a dream, a dream piece. Did George approach you and say, we should have the girls dressed in a certain way? 
Um, George Miller had seen a ballet in, I think in Germany, possibly Pina Bausch, where the um, dancers were lightly bandaged and he loved that image. So he wanted me to try and use that in these girls who were basically kept in a bubble and were just there to breed for Immortan Joe because they're trying to create some kind of continuity and everyone is sick and these five women are not sick. After all that sort of strange mayhem of the war boys and the blood bags and the wretched and the milkers, suddenly there's something rather pure and innocent. We never had a script, we had a series of storyboards put into some kind of book form by Brendan McCarthy. So we had some images that had been created. What's quite extraordinary about a project like this is how normal it becomes. At the beginning it's like, never seen, thought of anything like this, oh my God. And then as you work on the characters, they become completely normal and they are dressed according to what they need. And a lot of them need breathing apparatuses and they need body covering because they're all rotting, basically. And so these pure girls, I mean, the whole point is they're very pure. And I suppose I'm slightly emphasising that. I do things terribly instinctively. And of course George was incredibly involved. I mean, he's, he's not, um, I mean, he is a control freak, most directors are, but equally he's a very giving control freak. I mean, I think it's incredibly important because the costume, they're not costumes, they're clothes that the actors wear in, that, in their roles. And they have to express what that character is going through at any given time. And sometimes that character can't, can't verbally express it, but it can visually express it. I mean, for instance, when Sansa first meets Cersei right back in the beginning, we see her almost start to emulate, she, you know, she's known for sewing her clothes, so she emulates the style of King's Landing and it's not very well done to start with and then it sort of evolves and then later when she realises how awful it is, she tries to reverse back to her mother's style and then, and then you know, she has little finger stars. So she's always sort of weaving in and out because she tends to express herself quite visually, as does Cersei. You know, with her power dresses and and each each group have a look to them that sort of links them geographically to the area they come from and the type of characters they are so it, it's immensely important as a fantasy you have to ground it somehow otherwise it just makes no sense visually so i think that's something we work really hard on that you know the characters wear costumes or clothes that look like they live in the places that they live in and therefore I would work very closely again I should have said that earlier with with the um, production designer because I often look at the dwellings that they're supposed to live in and the climate and that will that will inform me as to the colors and the and the way these people live and what what they have available to them I think the the color of Eddie's coat was a very was our, my first starting point when it came to color um, we talked about general color and the palette of the rooms and the period, which, you know, when you see Catherine, you see her coat is very kind of the same values as, as the decor in the room around it, where Eddie's coat picks up some of the highlights of the room as opposed to the, to the sort of muted colors. It, my idea with his coat was not only the room, but, but his, his friends, his fantastic beasts, and to me, they were more influenced to me in a way with his palette than um, the environment. So when I came to the art department, at the same time I'm seeing all the environments, I see all the colors and what the creatures are gonna look like, which is a big part of, of Newt's character especially. I'm gonna ask a question for all of you now, which is um, what's the process when you receive a script? Is it the same or does it differ from film to film? You know, if you actually want to do it and you've met the director, um, and he's offered you the job, then it's a process of list making, to be quite honest. You know, writing it out, you just get it in your head, you get it in your head. And at the same time, you're researching, you're talking, your internet helps hugely these days for speedy access to images. But still, for me, there's nothing like looking through a book or in something, if it's modern, I people watch. I did something years ago, but it was 
sort of Royal Academy types. I used to sit in the cafe, the Royal Academy, and just watch. Because completely different people go to the Royal Academy for their morning coffee than will go to Starbucks down Piccadilly. I mean, it's just... It's amazing how you can't know every period and every, every world that you work on, so you do have to go and sit oh, sometimes. Yeah, it's impossible. Everyone okay. thinks you're an expert on every period, but actually you're not. No, you, you know. learn every yeah. time. I and mean, even if you've done a period before, if you, if you do another film set in the same period you've already done, yeah. it's always yeah. a different aspect different story, and you learn something else. Yeah. And when you get to the end of a job, you think, I always want to do it again because I know more. <laughs> you, exactly. you think, I wish you I could go back and start again down, because, yeah, you've just, you've just understood it. I think also the amazing thing, I think you probably feel the same, is like, you know, the privilege we have to uh, be constantly like, learning new things. Yes. I find that the most, for me, the most amazing thing, and I suppose for you too, is yeah. like all the, all, the, all the work we do before designing. I love to, you know, sort of merge into this sort of like mm -hmm. photography and paintings and looking at people. Yeah, I recently did a job which was set in the 90s, a true story. And so I had access to meet the real people who were being characterised. And so I went to meet this QC and he was completely flabbergasted at the detail I wanted to go into. And then, and I said, but this is the best bit. Yes. Yeah. We have to believe that they really loved each other and there was this other side to all the pomp and the wedding and the coronation to come and um, the little details like the little bow was really important to me and the little pin tucks on her outfit it showed this sort of sweetness um, and his open shirt sort of gives him a manliness and a sort of I guess we always see them so buttoned up and this gave us another look at them it was really important to get this this sort of reality across. Queenie to me was always a character on the page and then when we got Alison a character that was full of light, almost transparent. So her costumes, I used materials that you could see through, materials that, like the kind of clothes that men sort of look at and wonder what's underneath, um, which is part of her tease and her play with Dan in, in this part of the story. We had to do one, we had to open we had John Snow's coat, I had to be peel off, and they wanted that sound to be in the peeling, and we had. In the end, we had to work out how we could do that, and in the end, we actually put like fiberglass, fine fiberglass within a sort of sealed packet, so when it fold, folded back, it made the sound of like cracking ice. So there are all these sort of different little things which we have to think about and how we could do them, and it's fascinating. Mm -hmm.